Welcome to another sermon from the pulpit of the Spring Hill Church of Christ meeting at 405 Butler Street, Spring Hill, Louisiana, about three quarters of a mile south of the Arkansas state line. In just a few weeks, we will be coming up on Luke chapter 9 in our daily Bible reading program for 2024. If you've been following along with us as we read through the Gospels, uh, you know, the Synoptic Gospels and John, we've already covered John. We're into the Synoptic Gospels, reading them as a group now. And let me tell you, when you get to chapter 9, you better be strapped in and ready for a jam-packed chapter in regards to a lot of things taking place one right after another. Feels like some of our modern days, the way they're packed. Within this one chapter alone, we have the apostles. Notice this now. The apostles uh, sent out to work uh, teachings and healings, verses 1 through 6. And then we have the feeding of the 5,000, verses 11 through 17. Jesus asked the apostles then who they believe him to be, Luke uh, chapter 18 through 22, and his teachings on taking up his up the cross, our cross, and following him. The Transfiguration, verses 28 through 36, and then Jesus healing the man's uh, demon-possessed son, verses 37 through 43, and then we end up 43 through 56, some varying teachings as they make their way to Jerusalem for the last time. A very interesting chapter, I believe that's going to be, and you ought to look forward to being able to read that chapter. When you get there, read it slow and absorb what's taking place. But the most important, I think, and challenging teaching in this chapter is at the end, where arguably the most important teachings can be found. The verses we'll read here in just a few minutes, show us three different men who come to Jesus and express their desire to follow him as a disciple. Well, why wait? Let's go ahead and read that passage of Scripture. And here it is, as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, follow me, but he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead, but as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first go say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. But a book we've studied when we were in a men's Bible class in Wilmington, Illinois, or maybe in Man, uh, Mantino, one of those two places, was entitled Not a Fan by a man named Kyle Eidelman. Does an excellent job detailing and teaching on these particular verses. And as I read those three chapters, I couldn't help but think to myself, this will preach this explanation and what we find in these chapters. And thus, that's when I put this together. And so we want to, in this lesson, I thought we'd take some thoughts from this book and share them with the entire congregation as we consider this year's theme and focus on growing mightily and prevailing, doing that by learning from the examples of Jesus and his life. We've looked at people he's encountered. We're looking at various incidences that we find 
in the Gospels, and I believe there's a lot we'll learn about Jesus before this year is over. And I hope you stay intense into this study with us. We want to look at this idea that is brought about in this book of following Jesus wherever, whenever, and whatever we find our situation. That's what we want to look at. And so it's very important that we consider this. So let's consider these men that came to Jesus and his response and what can we learn from this incident, what we want to consider. Firstly, fully following Jesus means remaining faithful to him wherever we might go. That's important for us to consider. In verses 57 and 58, as they were going along the road, uh, someone said to him that he will, he said, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So the first man, comes to Jesus and says he will follow him wherever he goes. But Jesus responds by saying, foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. We might look at Jesus' reaction and think, well, that's a bit harsh. But Jesus, knowing the hearts of men, might have known that this man wasn't fully aware of where exactly he might be going to have to go to follow Jesus. And that's very important to consider. Many were well aware of the miraculous abilities of this man, Jesus, but they might have come to the belief that being with this powerful man would be a cure and remedy for stresses and difficulties of life, but it seems that Jesus didn't want for this man or any who might have been there with him to be misinformed at all. So Jesus' response to this man's statement seems pretty clear within my mind. You say that you're willing to go anywhere I go, but you must realize that following me will not lead you to a place of comfort in this life. Instead, it may very well and probably will lead you to a place of discomfort. Certainly, Jesus, speaking of the animals having proper resting places, and yet he himself having none, must have made an impression on those who were standing there and listening. This man said he would follow Jesus wherever, but did he truly mean wherever? Well, we must recognize that being faithful to Jesus will sometimes take us to difficult places in this life. It has been, has always been that way with faith, the faithful to God. As might have been the case with this man in Luke chapter 9 and verse 57, there are many people today who are disillusioned to the idea that following Jesus in this life will create an almost carefree and easy life because God loves me and will give me anything I want or desire. The health and wealth gospel, really the health and wealth heresy, has raised up a generation or more of people who claim to be Christians just so long as their faith takes them to someplace nice and comfortable. But friends, we must recognize that being faithful to God has never come with the promise that this life will be nice and comfortable and carefree. We can look all the way from nearly the beginning of the Bible and recognize that men who were faithful to God experienced very difficult and often uncomfortable circumstances. Their faith and following of God's will sometimes took them to places that they wouldn't have chosen to go otherwise. Would you consider just a few? Look at these, uh, if you will. Noah's faith and trust in God took him to the inside of a huge vessel that floated on water, and he had little time to control it as to where he might end up. 
Abraham's faith in God took him to a completely unknown land when he had made it back in the land where he had been proceeding. Moses, following of God's will, uh, will, took him before the most powerful man where he made demands that he let God's people go. David's faith in God took him to stand before a giant, the most feared man in all the land. The faith of the apostles took them to healings, stonings, and eventually their deathbeds. We must fully recognize that Following Jesus as a true disciple isn't going to take us into a life full of comfort and bliss in regards to this world. Now, simply striving for holiness and righteousness every single day will put us in uncomfortable circumstances as we see wickedness all around. We must keep in mind that we are only pilgrims and aliens in this life and that we are called to abstain from the lusts that surround us every day. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and in verse 11, Peter says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, that they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Why are we willing to do all these things? We should be willing to follow Jesus wherever he leads us because we want to be with him where he now resides in heaven. Yet we must remember that Jesus wasn't able to go to heaven until he had first gone to the cross. And the exact same thing is true for us. Just a few verses back in Luke chapter 9 and verse 23, and he said, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily. Notice that daily, not just on Sundays, but daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. So we see Jesus emphasizing this demand that those who follow him must take up their cross daily and die to self in order to live for him. The true problem we see all around us is that there are plenty of people who want to go to heaven, but they're not willing to follow Jesus there exactly as he got there. They want to go to heaven, but they're not willing to go to the cross first. For this is what Jesus demands. He demands that we go wherever he goes. This means we must go to the cross, and then we must be willing to do whatever uncomfortable place that follows if we truly want to be his disciples. Then following Jesus means following him right now without the delays. Luke chapter 9 Verse 59 and 60, we're going to see this second man. He says to another, here's the second man, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. So the second man. Jesus turns to him, follow me. This man seems willing to do so. He even calls Jesus Lord, but he wants to first go and bury his father before he follows Jesus. Now to us, this might not seem like an unreasonable response. The man's father just died, or at least that's what we think in our minds. So it seems like the right thing to do to allow him to go and tend to that matter. First, however, might I suggest that it could be possible that what this man is saying is, sure, I'll follow you, but first let me go and live my life, and once my parents die, then I will come follow you. This man seemed interested enough in following Jesus, but that interest wasn't enough for him to drop everything he was doing and go to follow the Lord right then and there. Maybe his parents 
wouldn't have been all that excited about him following his popular rabbi that was shaking things up. Maybe he had some family business that he had to attend to first. Maybe he was waiting for his share of the inheritance. Whatever his deal might have been, it was currently keeping him from going right away to follow Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus responded pure, pretty harshly. Allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Jesus wasn't willing to wait on this man. He only wanted for him to go now and do the work of Jesus had given him to do for the kingdom of God. So if we always are waiting for the perfect time to follow Jesus, then we will never follow him. Instead, we must realize that now is the right time to fully commit to being his disciple. I'm fully convinced that one reason so many professed Christians give less than all of themselves to the Lord is because they are thinking they just can give a little bit now and then at some point down the road they will make the full leap into true discipleship. There is normally something in their lives right now that they aren't willing to part ways with and it makes right now not the perfect time. Really, what they're saying is that right now isn't the easy time to give my life fully to Jesus. The reality is that there is no easy or perfect time to give our lives to Jesus because following Jesus will always require sacrifice. That is the whole idea behind taking up our cross and dying to self. Furthermore, if we're always saying day after day, tomorrow, then when will that day of change ever come? The truth is that it won't come. Tomorrow will never become today because we are repeatedly hitting the spiritual snooze button. We must not allow for ourselves to wind up in the same place as Felix found himself when he became frightened because he recognized the truth, and yet he told Paul, go away for the present, and when I find time, I will summon you. Acts chapter 24 and verse 25. We don't have any indication that Felix ever made such a call for Paul, but he had his chance in that moment to do what was right, yet he let it slip away in a favor of a time down the road. So we must instead be like the disciples of Jesus who respond in a much better fashion than the man we see here in Luke chapter 9 and verse 59. We can look to the responses of Peter, Andrew, James, and John in Matthew chapter 4 and in verse 18. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter, Andrew, his brothers, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Did they make excuse? Now look at verse 20. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left their, the boat and their father and followed him. And so we know exactly what we ought to do when we realize the need to follow Jesus. Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And they did that very thing immediately, right then and there. Too many people are waiting for that easy and perfect time, but they don't realize it right now is the right time. Right now, we all need the saving grace of Jesus. We are doing ourselves no favor if we're not willing to make a commitment right now where we are and follow him wherever it is that he might lead us. Like the song, where he leads, I will follow. 
then fully following Jesus means putting him first before everything. Look at our last two verses, Luke chapter 9 and in verse 61. Yet another one. I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus' response to this man, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. The last man we see coming to Jesus and saying that he will follow him, but first permit me to say goodbye to those at home. Again, this might not seem like all that unreasonable of a request, but that might speak more to our not understanding of the present day culture. It wasn't like it is nowhere we can move hours and hours away and still communicate with our loved ones. Back in these times, moving away was a huge ordeal and called for a grand celebration that wasn't likely to be some quick thing. These going away parties and the festivities could last days or even weeks. Jesus seemed to be pretty annoyed with the culmination of these men and says to the last man, no one after putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. In other words, you say that you are wanting to follow me forward, but I can tell you that your heart is elsewhere. You say you want to follow me, but I'm not at the top of your list of priorities. This man talked a good game, but his actions showed that there were other things that meant more to him at the moment. Therefore, he was not willing to go with Jesus right then, wherever it was that he might lead him and do whatever it was that he might demand. True discipleship can only exist in our lives if Jesus is our chief and truly only priority. There are so many people who want to have their cake and eat it too, as the old idiom says, when it comes to discipleship and following Jesus. Much like we talked about earlier, they want to follow Jesus only if he leads to comfort and ease, but that will never be the case when it comes to Jesus. Much of this is a result of the fact that following Jesus means that we must lay aside everything we want and simply do as Jesus wants. We must put aside everything that we long for and have a longing for only pleasing our Lord. This means anything that we might turn to instead of Jesus needs to be relegated from wherever it is to the top shelf, not the top stop. We must be, have Jesus on the top shelf and everything else on the bottom shelf or the next shelf. He must be our top stop. What might we turn to? Could we turn to food? Could we turn to lust? Could we turn to our kids? Could we turn to money? Could we turn to alcohol? Could we turn to any other worldly thing? Of course we could. But in doing so, we would only prove that Jesus isn't our true joy. He isn't our true strength and rock. We can look to diff uh, different men in the New Testament and find them as they having things they desire more than Jesus at that particular time. Nicodemus seemed to be a, to initially prefer his religious status above all else. The rich young ruler loved his stuff and didn't want to part ways. This man seems to love his family and friends and wasn't willing to give them up just yet in order to follow Jesus as a true disciple. Yet we know what Jesus thinks about our love for family above him. Just a few chapters later, in Luke chapter 14 and verse 26, we find Jesus stating clearly and bluntly, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, and yea, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. His point is crystal clear. Everything you love needs to take a back seat 
to your love for Jesus. Really, everything you love, you must hate in respect to how highly elevated Jesus is in your life, especially when he follows up these words by speaking concerning taking up his cross. Simply put, Jesus must be our priority in this life. If we truly desire to please him in all respects, then that means that we will fulfill whatever role that we might need to fill because he demands we fulfill it and we want to please him so badly. Our overwhelming love for Christ will cause us to love others because he commands that we do that. Putting Jesus first will only help us to keep everything else in our lives exactly where it needs to be, will help us keep our priorities in order. That's what most Christians have a problem with, is keeping their priorities in order. What about you? Is Jesus first in your life? These three men were all presented with the opportunity of a lifetime. They were offered the opportunity to be a literal follower of Jesus while he walked this earth. And yet, as best we can tell, none of them took advantage of this great blessing. The reasoning for such isn't hard to figure out. Being a true disciple of Jesus is difficult. It isn't for the half-hearted. It isn't for the casual follower. It is only for those who are truly willing to give it all up to God, yet they are willing to do so because they know that the reward is great and worthwhile. Really, when it comes to Jesus' desires for us, they are simple. We must admit that they are difficult as well because they demand everything from us. He wants for us to follow him wherever he leads. He wants for us to do whatever he demands, and he wants for us to do all that right now. The will of Jesus has been laid out before us. The ball is in our court. That's what we must understand. May God help us to follow his son wherever, whenever, and whatever it is we find ourselves in need of. And with that, Bob's your uncle. Now, the question was asked by the Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16 and verse 30. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? We learn in this passage of Scripture we learn the plan of salvation is that the gospel must be heard. You have to be careful what you hear nowadays and what you're around nowadays to hear. In Luke chapter 8 and verse 15, as for the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. You shall know the truth, Jesus said, the truth will set you free. The gospel must be believed. Jesus said, I told you you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, he said, you will die in your sins. John says Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Acts 16.31, the Philippian jailer was told to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You will be saved, you and your household. That's the beginning point to the plan of salvation. And then we learn that sins must be repented of. Luke 13.3 and 5, Jesus said, I told you no, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. We notice the act of repentance that the Philippian jailer did in Acts 16. He took them the same hour of the night, washed their stripes, and immediately he and his family were baptized. Acts 17.30, the time of this ignorance God overlooked now commands all men everywhere to repent. Then Christ must be confessed. Jesus said, whoever confesses me before men, him will I also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, verse 33, him will I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Romans 10.10, 10, with the mouth confession 
is made unto salvation. There must be scriptural baptism. Saul of Tarsus was asked, Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized. Wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Colossians 2.12, we learned that baptism is a burial in which you were raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. 1 Peter 3 and verse 21, even baptism thus also now save us, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. We learn there in that, in that passage. We are to be like newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that we may grow thereby. Barnabas encouraged those in Antioch to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose, Acts chapter 11 and verse 23. We learn that as we live the life of a Christian, we must add to our faith virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, temperance, we learn, our self-control, and self-control, steadfastness, with, and steadfastness, godliness, godliness, brotherly kindness, and brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We must add these things. And notice, dear friend, what he says about those who lack these qualities in verse 9 of that passage. He said he, he's nearsighted, that he's blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, conclusion as to why it's there now, here it is. Be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be glory now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Revelation 2.10 Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Now we must obey the gospel to be saved by the Lord in heaven. Second Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 8, Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Watch verse 9. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Then having purified your souls by obedience to the truth, for sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Have you done this? 1 Peter 1 verse 22. Matthew chapter 7 verse 13 says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many, but the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and few there are, that is, who find it. With that, Bob's your uncle. If you found this video helpful and want to learn more, be sure you download the note card that goes with this lesson and also our free four lesson Bibles correspondence course. The link to each will be found in the description below. We here at the Spring Hill Church of Christ meeting at 405 Butler Street, Spring Hill, Louisiana want to help you with your growth in your knowledge of God's Word. Remember we are in it for the likes and the subs so be sure you subscribe. Also like us and also tell your friends about us. So with that, in the meantime, in between time, we will see you next time. Cheerio, mate. Bob's your uncle.